I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. For those of you who feel like you're always putting out fires, that you never have time to get everything done, that your to-do list seems to never get shorter than 50, and that you are always beating back stress, this next podcast is for you. Imagine those days when you are the individual contributor or you're a seasoned leader, and it just seems like you're always behind the eight ball. You're always running, but never able to catch up. There's never any time for planning let alone real thought around how do you hand off your work to other people. And the world isn't getting any easier. The pressures from management, the economy, and the labor shortage is just making our work even more intense. Well, my next guest on the business of intuition says that what we need to start doing is thinking more from a systems perspective. Remember that book called The E-Myth? Well, if you haven't read it, it's a good one. It talks about why it's important to be able to imagine your business, whether you actually own it or not, as if it were a franchise, so that you then could create some processes and systems that later you could hand off to other people. Well, my next guest has been working off of another book called Work the System, which is, in a sense, the e-myth on steroids when it comes to actual practical ways in which to take those concepts. So, in the end, what we want to be able to do is take a step back and be able to find out all the things that we're doing in our job and be able to figure out what is effective us to do and what is effectively something that somebody else to do. Well, Josh Fonger is my next guest on the business of intuition, and he really studies this stuff around systems thinking and being able to create systems that you could hand off to other people so that they and you could be a lot more productive and a lot less stressed out. Joss is an international business consultant, coach, and speaker, and he has a unique experience of personally helping hundreds of businesses grow simply by using this this method that I've been describing. His speciality is in taking stressed out entrepreneurs and business leaders, working from in their business to working on their business using systems so that profit and freedom can become a consistent mechanical reality. Josh Fonger on the business of intuition. So Josh, it's great to have you a guest on the show. And I'm very interested in hearing more about your system and the way you've been able to help entrepreneurs grow and scale what they're all about. I kind of want to focus a little bit at this point on the person who is a, a manager of a team working for a fairly stable company. And yet they're probably not utilizing as much resources as they should, that they need more resources. They're getting a little bit crispy around the edges. They've got too much to do. Uh, Certainly with the great resignation, a lot of companies have not yet filled out all of their FTEs, if you will. So a lot of people are doing the work of one or two or even three people. So there's a lot on their plate and they just want to kind of get through the week. And I guess my question is, you know, if you take a look at that, that individual who's working awfully hard, but just wants to become more productive and feels like all they're doing is putting out fires, you know, they're not a- able to kind of step back and to be able to look at the big picture because they're always putting out fires. What sort of ideas and tips might you have for, for such an overworked individual? Yeah. Well, and to start off, Dean, thanks again for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here and uh, share what I've been practicing, which is based on Sam Carpenter's best-selling book, Work the System, for those watching this on the video. But in the concepts in the book and what I try to apply using his methodology is first we call a systems mindset. So if you're a manager or an owner and you're overwhelmed every single day and you've reached you know, your max, which is plateau, which is what most people we work with have hit that, that max stop point, we want them to get outside themselves. We call it outside and slightly elevated and to examine themselves and their day objectively as a third person, as opposed to reactively 
you know, physically being there. And there's a whole exercise behind that. But when you do that, you can see that your life and the work that you're doing in your department as a manager is systematic. There's a lot of repeatable things. There's things that you're reacting to, but you could predict that they're going to happen again and again and again. And as opposed to shuffling the stress, shuffling the bad results, shuffling the continuous or consistent problems, instead, if you step back, you could realize if you developed, and we, we focus on documentation, but if you develop and then document the systems that make up what you do, what your team does, eventually those problems aren't going to be happening anymore because you're going to be cutting out variability. You're going to be cutting out waste in terms of time and materials. And you're going to be empowering your people who are beneath you instead of them always doing it slightly wrong and asking you for help. They're going to know exactly what to do and how to do it. And those problems are going to go away. And so a big part of our efforts when we systemize a business is to prevent problems from happening in the first place, freeing up owners and managers' time, bandwidth, to take on those special projects, to um, take on new initiatives, and ideally grow the, grow the business instead of just babysitting problems and putting out fires. And oftentimes when I talk to managers, their life is, why well, just put out fires? And I ask the question, well, is there a way to prevent those fires? And they're so used to a status quo and everyone gets used to what, what is normal that they have a hard time realizing, hey, you know what? If the people underneath me actually did know how to do it the right way, they wouldn't be asking me those questions. Maybe there's ways of scaling myself. And I think that's a big part of what we try to do with your documentation is that you're one-to-one, if your voice to their ears, it's a one-to-one ratio. But if you're able to communicate in a way that is scalable, whether through some kind of recording device or some kind of a transmiss- uh, transmittable documented process, you've now taken your voice and you've multiplied it and you've made it so you don't have to repeat the same thing over and over again. You just have to do it once. And so simplest concept mm-hmm. there would be like a recipe. Okay. So there's a lot you just said there. We need to unpack some of it. So I, I love the idea. And we sometimes have coached our people as well is to take a step back and try to understand what's going on from that higher altitude, that third person that you just mentioned. Can you give us an example about how that would work? Like mm-hmm. if you, if I, if you are coaching me and I'm this person that we just described earlier on, and you said, Dean, you need to kind of take a third person perspective to be able to see what's going on. How do I do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the practical and oftentimes painful and tedious way to do it is actually to track down every single minute of your day and write down what you actually do. Because a lot of times people fantasize about what they're doing and they, they have these you know, beliefs about what they're actually doing, but if they wrote down actually what they're doing throughout the day, and we recommend a minimum of two days, it's very tedious, then you're going to see, oh, I'm actually... I have the same recurring problem happening. I have the same wasted time. I have the same, you know, you, you name it. You know, you're commuting right in the middle of rush hour every single day. Maybe you should shift it and be a little more efficient. You know, there's all these things that people end up doing that are highly inefficient. And then also we find out that they're also organizing their day improperly as well. And again, it's them responding to fires and that's how they organize their day instead of saying, you know what, if I was stepping stepping back, I would actually organize my day totally different. And so that's, that's the exercise we take you mm. through. And it's usually kind of embarrassing. So we have to get to build some trust with them first. Yeah. And they're like, wow, I'm really wasting a lot of my day, aren't I? <laughs> so well, it very reminds me of that, you know, if you guys remember this, uh, who are listening in on Stephen Covey's work many years ago when he had a, oh, what was it? The seven habits of highly effective people. And, and one of those particular habits had to do with the kind of gridding out where you spend your time. Are you in box one, which is urgent and important? Are you in box two, which is important, but not urgent and so on? And you can sort of place them in the right box and say, whoa, I'm spending 40% of my time in things that are not important and urgent. I mean, that's that's a problem here. So in a sense, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to lump you together, but it sounds like it, it reminds me of some of those things that we've heard in the past. Am, am I in the right track? Uh, definitely. Yeah. So Sam Carpenter, the author of the book, he definitely says that Stephen Covey was one of the inspirations. The same with the book, E-Myth. There's a lot of books, but... I was going to um, ask you about the E-Myth too. Yeah. yeah. So give, yeah. would you, like, are you, we talk about the E-Myth a lot with our clients as well, but 
just from your standpoint, what's a quick synopsis of the E-Myth? Because that might be another resource for people to read in addition to the book that you just referenced. Yeah, well, uh, quick quick note is that the most common phrase we get is that work the system is the is the book that Michael Gerber never wrote. <laughs> so okay. he would have written the next book, like the how-to book. And so, so Michael talk- Gerber, by the way, those of who are listening in is the author of the book called The E-Myth, and it actually went through a revised version. I think it's called Re- E-Myth Revisited or re- you know what have you. So there's now two versions of it, um, but you're saying it's it's still missing some of the how tos. Yeah, that's basically what we do. Is that most companies start start off with the um, the owner being also the the technician, the one who's actually doing the work. And so as they're growing the business, they're growing their work hours, but they're not able to figure out a way to get freedom from the business because they're they're the one who actually has to be there. And that's kind of the entrepreneurial myth that you're going to have freedom, but you end up just building a job for yourself. And you don't see your business as separate from yourself. And so a big part of what we do is get people into the non-urgent but important section of Stephen Covey's mm-hmm. matrix there and get them to say, hey, you need to actually work on your business. And when Michael Gerber talks about working on your business, this is what he means. Actually uh, putting in the strategic objective, the principles, the procedures, the, you know, the, the structural elements of your business, the scaffolding, which will allow it to grow, which will empower your team and which will give you that quality control and consistency, as opposed to just thinking it's going to happen through more hard work and, um, and mind read. Because uh, ultimately, you can bring in great people, but if they don't have, and I was kind of mentioning the, the analogy of a restaurant, right? You can bring in a bunch of great cooks or chefs, but if they don't have consistent recipes and know what they're trying to hit, they're going to be all over the map, right? You can even just say, hey, make us some cheeseburgers. Well, they're all going to do it differently. It's all going to taste differently, and you're not going to have a quality result, even with great cooks or chefs. And um, so the point is, this is where the documentation and the systemization comes in. So, uh, Josh, I mean, I get it, man. I mean, you you know, I got you. Hello, right? I I understand what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense to me. And here's here's what I want to have you help me and, and, and maybe help our other listeners on this. I get that. I even tell people that. (laughs) <laughs> we've been at this for 30 years. Do you think that I've done what you just said we should do? Well, a little bit, right? Because I'm urgency addicted. I like getting stuff done. I have a certain sort of self-worth on doing what feels like immediate important work. What you sound like, what you want us to do feels about as fun as watching paint dry because it just doesn't have the spice that our work does. And I'm just playing with you, right? You know, but how do you help these drivers out there, these urgency addicted, get her done now kind of people? Hey man, intellectually, I got it, but I haven't made the mindset, mind shift yet to be able to go, okay, I'm willing to take four hours to figure out what I did over the last two days and then create systems out of that. How do you help me? <laughs> I tell them to give me a call, right? <laughs> that's our <laughs> that's our business, right? <laughs> yeah, no one wants to do it, right? Uh, this is uh, this is the boring but true aspect of, of business. It's it's why big companies typically have their documentation order, and small companies stay small. Do you out of business. do you do the documentation for them, or do you say yeah. no? Only you can do this. I, Ergo, I'm going to provide you the support, but I can't do it for you. Which one is it? We'll do it yeah. through interviews, well, et cetera, yeah. or we will hold your hand and, you know, give you a martini when you get really sad. Yeah. Well, in, you know, we're full service, right? So you could, you could be anywhere in between. So we do some coaching, we do some training where we give them support and tools. And then we also do consulting where we actually will interview and record and, and document and proceduralize a company for them. And so there, there is a range. And okay. uh, we're here to make that a reality. It's, it's best if the more we can involve the people who are doing the work to provide the content, because again, we can't be experts in every industry. So right. they have to bring their expertise. And it could be an interview, it can be a recording, video, audio, um, some way to extract the data, but then we're expert in actually getting the data in a usable fashion that, that's scalable for boarding and training, and accountability and management, things like that. So, all right, let me, I, I, I'm being devil's advocate for you because I want, I, I believe in your work. So let me just say that. But I also want to be anticipating what others might be thinking and wondering as they hear what they have to say. So, okay, so you've got 
somehow this manager of this company was able to take some time and maybe with some support from somebody else, or maybe, maybe you, for example, and they create these, this map, the system of what gets done. My question then is, how do you get that person to now follow that? You know, again, it's one thing to say something. It's another thing to do it. How do we get that? Those, I mean, really, we're talking about change management here. Systems, mm -hmm. yes, I get it. But it's running the show or people's behaviors and attitudes. How do we shift them to an attitude of more proactive system base versus reactive firefighting base? Yeah, great question. And uh, you're right, it is uh, change management and it works on multiple levels, you know, mindset, strategy, culture, all these things. But yeah. um, from a very just like practical standpoint, there's a, a few ways you'd want to approach it. If it's a manager who's really busy and you can see all the things you do, they do. You could say, hey, manager, you're required to make sure this gets done. But you're not required to do it yourself, right? So you're mm -hmm. required for the results, but you're not necessarily required for the doing. And it looks like these things are tasks other people could do if you empowered them. And of course, they would say, well, they would do it wrong or they don't have the experience. They don't know. And then you could say, well, what if you documented how it's supposed to get done? Oh, okay. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I guess if I wrote it down in detail, they could probably do it. And that's kind of the whole idea is it's, it's simple delegation. They probably just have been burned before in the past. They've had a bad experience in the past. Mm. Something that's preventing them from taking that risk because it's their responsibility that it's done right. And so you have to show them, hey, with this tool, you're going to be able to get your team to do it right and then give them something that they can start to see that tangible win. And then they start to say, well, gosh, I could do this and I could do this. And you know, especially if they do have support staff that is below them. And also systemizing the support staff, usually they're not as efficient as they could be. You might right. say, hey, you know, they could be way more effective. I was thinking that a practical and maybe less painful way of doing this, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is to say, let me bring in my assistant. You know, we're going to figure out what my systems are, or I'm going to bring in this person who's on my team and the ultimate idea is that maybe some of what I do could be delegated to them or others. But have the team member almost be the interviewer of the manager and say, tell me what you do on this. And then they become the documenter who takes down the data and, and fills it all out. And then together, the leader and the manager or the leader and the employee in this case could talk about like, oh, gosh, there's a lot of stuff that I don't need to be doing. And that's what you should be doing. And all of a sudden, now that the person your your head is going, yes, those of you who are not being able to see this can go, but Mr. and Mrs. Manager, I could do that. I could do that. I mean, I'm, I'm good at that. Or I have energy. I have bandwidth. Right. So I just, I'm sort of seeing a, a kind of a way of knitting this together in a way that doesn't feel so daunting is to have the person you want to eventually delegate to be the person who's interviewing you around these systems. That's a great way to do it. It's definitely a technique. Oftentimes, when a company is hiring somebody and they say, well, I don't have a job description. I don't have procedures for them. Can I even hire them yet? What are they going to do? And we'll encourage them to bring them on board. And as you're training that person in the various tasks they're going to do, record it, the screen record, video record. And so you're, you're, you're procedurizing, maybe, the not, maybe not the best scalable way to procedurize, but you're doing the first draft of it live with that person. Yeah. And then they're going to do the task a few times and they're going to write it down because they're, they're getting their, their pay is likely significantly less than the manager. And then they'll write down, they'll pass that back up to the manager and say, hey, I've been doing this for a while. What do you think of this process? The manager can give some feedback. Lo and behold, that manager's now handed that one particular entity, that system off. And their life is probably composed of lots of entities. And what we find is that once we shift a manager's mindset, they realize that there's a lot of things in their life, both, both personally and professionally, that they've never really taken the time to think through. And therefore, they have unmanaged and therefore uncontrolled results. And oftentimes, they're, they're negative and consistent. And so we want them to, to know, hey, this is going to change your, this could change your health. This could change your relationship. Mm. This could change a lot of things in your life if you apply the same principle. And again, that's what we try to do is make, make a total transformation. It's interesting because when you shed light on the systems where before they were sort of hidden and done, you know, by a individual or an individual, I should say, 
you really sort of get an accounting of the work and the time it takes to do it. So then you would say, I just figured out all of the 155 things that I do in a week. And I've been able to map out how much time it takes. Oh, and lo and behold, there's more than I have hours in the day. But when you go back up to senior leaders and say, I need help, I need an FTE, it sometimes is perceived as this person's just kind of whining. You know, they're not really working hard enough. You know, I'm not saying in most cases, but sometimes that happens. But now all of a sudden you have documentation. I just went through this accounting and I've got 155 different things and I've got 2,000 hours worth of work that is on a normal week. Obviously, that's not sustainable, nor is that possible. And that's why certain things don't get done. This is why we need to be able to ask for more resources, more help in order to do that or change the expectations. I like it. I like it a lot. It, it, it makes total sense. And I think that doing that certainly would help. And then I think also listing out the high value leverage activities that management might do in terms of coaching, in terms of leadership, in terms of special projects, things that are out of the box and innovative and not so routine and saying these initiatives are going to double, triple, quadruple the value of my agency or my department. And these are the things that just have to get done that are rote. And so these things, we need to figure out a way where someone else who's who is a line level staff can do this so that I can then do these things that you really want done. I think it's a really strong case for a manager to make in terms of understanding the cost of you know, the staff to do the work and the value of what they really need to be done. And this is the same exercise we take entrepreneurs through and say, hey, what is your time worth to the business? Is it worth $300 an hour, $500 an hour, $800 an hour? Okay, well, let's look at your list of activities. Are any of these activities worth less than $500 an hour? Yeah, a lot, a lot right. of them are. And then we'd say, okay, well then why are you doing them? And oftentimes they don't have the staff to do them yet. And then we'll say, well, then let's build a plan to start to build in the resources to, to gobble these things up instead of just saying, well, it just is the way it is. I mean, you can start mm-hmm. to move towards something. It might take a month. It might take six months, but it's, it's worth doing instead of just staying stuck and staying in this uh, you know, victim mentality of like, it's just, there's never going to be enough time. There's always going to be too much work. Right. It's just the way it is. My industry is always this way. And just don't settle for that. There, there are ways to build this, this upward momentum and this freedom from the day-to-day, you know, the day-to-day struggle if you're willing to siege peace and then you know, mechanically work, work it through. I think that there's an argument that somebody may make that says, this will work in a very mechanized process business. Like think about Six Sigma, you know, we're trying to reduce air rates on airplanes, right? So we're trying to manufacture with the least amount of, of errors. And so we have a system to, that coincides with a manufacturing plan uh, that they've set into motion. But so many businesses obviously are, are very fluid. Some of them are very much like healthcare, for example, or marketing and so forth. There's a lot of fluidity. There's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of collaboration that one might say, ah, but this won't work in this system, you know, because of the com- because of the complexity of it. You know, it's a constantly changing ecosystem. How could you create a system in a world in which everything is always changing, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess I want to throw you a softball on this, but tell me what your thoughts are on this, is that there are going to be spaces for the unknown, the blue sky. We are, the, the, the system actually isn't, the doing the work, the system is actually how we have conversations. It's how we do innovation. What's our system for innovation? What's our system for blue sky thinking? You know, what's our system for collaborating in a conversation? You know, all those things can be, our process can be identified that way, not just in terms of how work is done. It can be a behavior system, not just a work system. Correct? Definitely. Yeah, okay. definitely. So communication <laughs> systems, the whole chapter in a book, and yeah, just like how to have an effective meeting, whether that's a meeting about creativity or innovation, or it's a meeting about advertising or how to hire, but every single aspect of your business can be thought of that way. Now, how to have you know, a meeting designed specifically for innovating new products is probably not going to have you know, step one, step two, step three, as, as you know, diagrammed out as that, as a procedure for how to process a, a 
customer refund, right? That may be very right. specific. Right. Um, exactly. But some things are are more open ended, and they're more principles to keep in mind. We call them guideline procedures. Are principles to keep in mind while working this particular system. Like um, I've got a real estate investor right now, and he has investment guidelines. It's not one, two, three, four because he's got to think strategically. But it's yeah. all of the best practices and the, the the strategies that he's learned to invest well into a document, a procedure, so that others can help him. And that so he can prevent himself from getting emotionally involved with this particular deal, but instead be, you know, keep his mind sharp on what actually has worked before in the past. I think this is great, Josh. I mean, I'm thinking about some of the stress and some of the worry that people go through at times, and certainly now is not any different. And that by providing people some clarity calms them down. You know, and I don't, it doesn't mean that the work necessarily is necessarily less, maybe it is. But I kind of now know how to do it. You know, you've told me how to do it. I, maybe I already know how to do it, but I didn't know I knew how to do it, you know. And maybe I can actually start giving this off to other people, but I can't give it off to other people until I know what it is that I need to give off. It's really good. So this has been really useful. So tell us a little bit more about how people can connect to you, your organization, should anybody want to, like, talk to you in, in, at great length on this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, we always uh, encourage people, you know, step one to get the, the summary of the book, Work the System. So they can get that on my website, wtsenterprises.com. And there they get a uh, summation of the book and uh, certainly uh, the resources that we can email them to help them along the way. Or they can get the book, Work the System. But beyond that, like you mentioned in the beginning, we do do coaching, consulting. And then I certify consultants in the Work the System method. And so we have a team of consultants around the world who also do coaching and consulting in various industries and in various locations around the world. Fantastic. But Josh, thank you so much for your time and your energy and for taking what I think is a difficult topic and creating some clarity around it. I really do appreciate that. All right, Dean, thanks a lot. You bet. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.